In this lecture, we will talk about carbon dioxide transport. We will explain how carbon dioxide is carried in the blood and its implications for acid-based homeostasis. We will also describe the role of chemoreceptors in the control of ventilation. Carbon dioxide is transported mainly in the plasma as bicarbonate ion. This is very different from oxygen, which is transported mainly bound to hemoglobin. So let's look at our overall percentages. CO2 dissolves well in the plasma. About 10% will be directly dissolved in the plasma as CO2. About 60% is going to react with water in the plasma and in the red blood cells to be carried as bicarbonate. The CO2 can also be bound to hemoglobin, so the remaining 30% will be carried on hemoglobin. So 10% dissolved in plasma, 60% dissolved in plasma as bicarbonate, and 30% bound to hemoglobin. This is a summary of how carbon dioxide is carried as bicarbonate. Remember from our acid-base lectures that CO2 reacts with water to form a proton and bicarbonate. It does this using the carbonic anhydrase enzyme to move the reaction forward more quickly. So the carbonic anhydrase enzyme helps to facilitate the reaction to form carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid dissociates very quickly into a proton and bicarbonate. So overall, CO2 is going to enter the blood through diffusion gradients and then several changes will take place. In the plasma, there will be a slow reaction to bicarbonate. In the red blood cells, we have a lot of carbonic anhydrase, so there will be a fast reaction to bicarbonate in the red blood cells. The bicarbonate will then be returned to the plasma through a chloride bicarbonate channel that's located in the membrane of the red blood cells and then that bicarbonate that was converted in the red blood cells will be carried in the plasma. So all of this together accounts for that 60% of bicarbonate within the plasma. It's just that the red blood cells help it with the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. The reaction will reverse in areas where we need to release carbon dioxide. So when we have high bicarbonate, this reaction can go in the opposite direction. And this would happen, for example, at the lungs, where we want bicarbonate to combine with the acid to become free carbon dioxide. And then that free carbon dioxide can be released into the alveoli and out of the lungs. So just like in the oxygen transport lecture where we talked about the binding and unbinding of oxygen to hemoglobin, important when we're thinking about the different areas of exchange, we also want to think about moving forward and moving in reverse for this bicarbonate reaction in different areas where we either need to be carrying bicarbonate or releasing bicarbonate. So here's a summary diagram of CO2 exchange at the tissues. Let's zoom in and take a look here. So the CO2 will be produced in the tissues. Those high CO2 levels are going to cause gas exchange for the CO2 to leave the tissues and enter the blood. As the CO2 enters the blood, some of it will stay dissolved in plasma. Other CO2 will enter the red blood cells and interact with the carbonic anhydrase enzyme. When it does that, the reaction will move forward and bicarbonate will be produced. That bicarbonate doesn't stay in the red blood cells. It shifts out of the red blood cells in exchange for chloride. We call that the chloride shift. And then the bicarbonate will enter the plasma. 
Don't forget, we have a small amount of carbon dioxide that enters the red blood cells and binds to hemoglobin. That will stay bound to the hemoglobin until it's released later. This is what happens at the tissues. Now let's look at CO2 exchange at the lungs. At the lungs, we need to reverse this reaction. So the bicarbonate reaction will reverse to release CO2 out of the alveoli. So let's zoom in on this one. So here we have the bicarbonate in the plasma. It will enter the red blood cells through that same chloride shift. When it enters the red blood cells, that reaction will reverse and it will form free carbon dioxide. That free carbon dioxide will then diffuse out of the red blood cells and into the alveoli where it can be released out of the airways. The CO2 that was dissolved and the CO2 that was bound to hemoglobin can also freely diffuse across into the alveoli and be released as well. By the way, notice on these last two diagrams that we also have the oxygen carrying described. So if you want to review oxygen transport, take a minute to pause and take a look at the oxygen transport as well. What's important to understand about carbon dioxide transport is that carbon dioxide changes blood pH. Increasing carbon dioxide in the blood directly increases acid in the blood and lowers blood pH. As the CO2 reacts with water to produce bicarbonate, free hydrogen ions are also released. When we have free hydrogen ions, we increase the acid level in the blood. So the CO2 must be removed in order to prevent low blood pH or acidosis. The flip side of that is CO2 can also be retained if blood pH is too high and we need to balance an alkalosis. So think back a little while to our acid-base lectures where we talked about changing the levels of CO2 in order to balance acid-base disorders. This is how the respiratory system changes CO2 levels in order to balance acid-base. And it's going to do that through signals at the chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors sense carbon dioxide, pH, and in some cases, oxygen. And they will change the rate of ventilation based on those levels. We have two primary types of chemoreceptors. Peripheral chemoreceptors that are located in the carotid and aortic bodies near the carotid and aortic arteries, and the central chemoreceptors that are located in the brainstem. These will send signals to the brainstem to regulate the rate of ventilation. If acid levels are too high, they will increase ventilation to remove CO2. If acid levels are too low, they will retain CO2 by decreasing ventilation and causing the acid levels to go back up. Peripheral and chemoreceptors sense these molecules slightly differently. Peripheral chemoreceptors directly detect pH, also carbon dioxide and oxygen. Their most important signal is low pH and high CO2. When the peripheral chemoreceptors sense low pH and high CO2, they will send signals to the brainstem to increase breathing rate. It's only at very low oxygen levels that the peripheral chemoreceptors will respond to oxygen. So at very, very extremes of hypoxemia, we're talking below 60 millimeters of mercury, they will increase the breathing rate because of oxygen levels. Central chemoreceptors are also sensitive to pH. This is sensitive to the pH in the cerebrospinal fluid. What will happen here is that CO2 will enter the cerebral spinal fluid because the blood-brain barrier allows gases to diffuse. When the CO2 enters the CSF, pH of the CSF will go down. So low CSF pH will be sensed by the central chemoreceptors directly related to carbon dioxide levels. That will then send a signal 
to the brainstem to increase breathing rate. One important clinical note here is that chemoreceptors become insensitive to chronically high levels of carbon dioxide. That means in a patient, for example, a patient with COPD that has really high levels of carbon dioxide chronically, the chemoreceptors will no longer respond to that high CO2. Then the primary drive for a change in ventilation are the extremely low levels of oxygen that trigger the peripheral chemoreceptors. This is important to understand because in these patients, it is actually their hypoxemia that is giving them the drive to breathe. If we then treat these patients, for example, with oxygen, the oxygen levels can actually decrease their drive to breathe. So we have to be careful for COPD patients not to give them extremely high levels of oxygen because that can depress their breathing rate because of the sensation of the peripheral chemoreceptors. You will learn more about these effects in your medicine courses when you talk about patients with chronic respiratory disorders. But just remember, the hypoxic drive in patients with high levels of carbon dioxide is maintaining their breathing rate. So we need to be careful about how we treat these patients so their breathing rate doesn't get too low. Okay, that's it for this one. Let me know if you have any questions.